that's just part of connect, you know, that's part of the tradition. Um, and we do try our best to get at the truth and, or, you know, the truth is too, too grandiose, but we try to get the facts out. We try to not let people hide behind their corporate veneer. We try not to let them get away with, you know, BSing the audience. And as I say, my only role as an interviewer and other moderators is to represent the audience. I'm there representing the audience. You're listening to The Real Estate Sessions. I'm your host, Bill Risser, with Fidelity National Title, Tampa District. Thanks for tuning in as we uncover the stories of leaders in our industry. Hi, everybody. Welcome to episode 220 of the Real Estate Sessions podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you so much for telling a friend. I have been uh, connected to my guest today for about 15 years, although he may not know that because it was through his company. It, it began around 2005 when I started following Inman News. I, I actually got to first meet Brad in 2012 as a New York Inman Connect ambassador. Um, passionate, opinionated, sometimes confrontational. Uh, Brad and his team have become the national go-to resource for breaking real estate news and in-depth examinations of the industry. I can't tell you how excited I am to get to this chat today with Brad. So let's get started. Brad, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Bill. Great to be here. I'm honored, actually, because you want to you won a big Inman Award this year. So this is like you're a world-class media company. I'm honored that I would be asked to be on the show. Wow. I, I'm, I'm, thank you so much for saying that. I, but, but I have to ask you a very difficult question up front. As we were preparing for this, this interview, you, you made a comment to me like, Bill, I don't really keep a calendar. And so I, I, I had to kind of send a few extra additional emails to kind of keep you in the loop for our meeting today. But are you honestly telling me you, you don't keep a calendar? I don't. Bill, um, which is tricky um, for these kind of things. Like I ask you to remind me a couple times, which put a you know kind of a burden on you. Uh, I don't speak much anymore except my own events. It's pretty hard for me to forget those. Where I do speak, though, I you know I have to go to great lengths to make sure I don't blow it and not go there. But it's kind of part of an overall. You know, I took my life really overly seriously my whole life, and this is part of a larger sort of approach to life. I have. I live. I don't have a watch. I, I stay away from clocks. I have no alarm clock. I buy one-way tickets. I read um, physical books now. I start an ebook company, which I sold, but I don't read ebooks anymore. But my my latest addition to my life that's really been quite um, fantastic, actually, is I live by the hourglass. I have an hourglass wherever I go. Um, my friends are starting to get them, and the concept is a day at a time. Well, that sounds like you're in an AA, which is great. But, uh, <laughs> Live in the present, that's impossible. Uh, five minutes is hard. So an hourglass is an hour. So when my wife Yas and I wake up in the morning, we have our coffee, we turn the hourglass on, and that reminds you to make the most of that hour. And so we're living an hour at a time, and the hourglass is a way to do that. It was invented in the 14th century, the same time as a mechanical clock. But people uh, decided to adopt the mechanical clock because it was during kind of the Renaissance. So the idea was you live eternally which we really don't. There's a beginning and the end. And that's the way, the reason I like the hourglass, there's a beginning and there's an end. And that's what life's about. And as I'm in my, you know, last quarter, I think Tibetans would say the, and there's four parts. Um, you've got to, you got to live that fourth quarter, uh, in a more purposeful, meaningful, and in a, in a, in a, a, a way that you can grasp the moment. And the best way for me to do that is to live an hour at a time. God, I got very philosophical on a Saturday morning. I'm really sorry, Bill. Your poor listeners. I, I, I apologize. Well, no, I, I think that's great. I want to take it a step further. So for those that aren't in their fourth quarter, how about those in their second or third quarter? There's got to be a way to incorporate that philosophy or that thought process, even though they may be in a position where they've got to have appointments and calendars and things, right? Well, for the young people, which is most of the Inman audience and readership, um, I I don't think they should do any of the nonsense I'm talking about, actually. Okay. Um, and I don't think they should read self-help books. And I think podcasts are fine and being informed is great. But I never read a self-help book in my life. I just live life as fully as I could every second and every moment and trusted. You know, then your gut, you shouldn't trust so much, but I did. And, uh, you know, I, don't, I didn't go out and purposely find mentors. Mentors come to you if you hang around the winners and not the whiners. And uh, if if your purpose in life is to do things and create things and be productive, those associations are around you. I had five mentors, but I didn't look for a mentor. I get calls all the time. Will you be my mentor? And I go, no, 
you know, I don't waste your time. Go live an engaged life. Do the right thing. Be productive. And you suddenly will find all of these really cool, creative people around you. And you then will look back and say, wow, I had these handful of mentors that really that changed my life. And that's that's the thing that happened to me that I'm so forever grateful for. When you get older, you can reflect and do all this BS. I still don't read self-help books. but um, And I don't know if the hourglass is right. But if I was 25, I wouldn't get an hourglass. Now, I've got to ask you about the mentors, right? We, I, I usually on this podcast like to talk about where people, you know, the beginnings of their life and and kind of their backstory. But I'd, I, maybe I, I throw a little switch in here. And can I, was this something you'll talk about? Can we talk about those early mentors and how they helped you? Yeah, I mean, there's some people in my life. I had an editor as a young man, as a writer, uh, that was extremely influential, that told me simple things like how to structure a story. I worked with a certified jerk who knew business development uh, like the back of his hand. And he taught me how to do deals and do business development. You know, I had an uncle that took me to the patent office when I was eight years old to register my automatic bed maker and influence my life in just such meaningful ways. So the idea of invention, the idea of writing, my whole life is about writing. I write every morning. Uh, it's my yoga. And so having that editor, um, I met a guy who thought big, acted big, was bold and big influence on my life, you know, that, that was so meaningful. Um, and I had two of those. And the idea that live life fuller, be, you know, think bigger, act bolder. Um, and then, you know, I've had mentors who said, you know, never do, never get so big that you do business with people you don't like. That's for me kind of impossible, but it's, it's a good message. Um, so there's several, I could go into detail. I've written about them, which maybe someday I'll publish, but Let's go back a little ways. Let's talk about um, heading off to Boston College. I mean, you're a Midwesterner, right? But by birth. Yeah, Boston University, actually. I'm sorry, Boston University. So let's talk about uh, those the years. Side, the wrong side of the Charles River. I mean, sorry, I, I could get a lot of trouble no, with that. No, no, the same side as Boston College. We call Boston University and Boston College the wrong side of the of the Charles River because the other side is Harvard and MIT, where I did. <laughs> go. <laughs> gotcha. That makes sense. Yeah. So talk, talk about, were, did you know early on journalism was for you? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I was a young man and my dad loved to read and loved to read newspapers. And it was back in the day where there was a morning and evening paper. And uh, I, I was very short, but I love sports because he likes sports. And, you know, the, the father son relationship is so dynamic in all of us. Uh, even I, you know, good friends that have lost their fathers. Um, you know, there's this thing there that's so real. There's a lot of been good writing about it in the last decade. And it was really influential, you know, to to not a impress your father was important, but also to be like your father. And I think he secretly wanted to be a journalist. He was a small town retailer, you know, which is a real hard job. And so just weirdly in high school, I got a call from the superintendent who said, would you write the weekly column for the Carlinville Democrat, which is our local newspaper, not the, you know, high school newspaper. And so I did that. And my father coached me the whole way because he kind of got out all the things he ever wanted to do, like profiling people and adding color and detail and, you know, very specific pieces to a story. And that hung with me forever. That didn't make me a professional writer by any means. I, oh, my writing was pretty bad, actually. It was only later that I picked up the skills to, you know, hopefully, and, and I still make mistakes, but uh, lots of them. But um, I just, I love to write. I can't, and I write 90% I write, I write, I'm the only reader. I don't publish most of what I write. Wow. Um, let's talk about Boston University those years. Yeah, I was a total, uh, you know, lone ranger. I didn't live in the dorm. I figured out a way not to. I lived in the south end of Boston, which is uh, then was kind of what they might have called the ghetto. Um, it wasn't gentrifying yet. And I, was, I had a bicycle and long hair. You know, I, I spent summers. I, I went to this joint program that I that, you know, urban studies that, that, that with Harvard and, uh, at the summertime, I worked at Bartley's burger cottage across from Harvard yard. I, um, I was an activist. I opposed the death penalty. It somehow, I just found that disgraceful. And, um, I got really into urban studies and cities being from the country, a small town, the cities really inspired me in so many ways. And, you know, I, um, that kind of got me into real estate watching, looking, studying Boston, you know, as part of my, my educational quest. But my educational quest was less about anything I did in the university. I wasn't a member of fraternity. I wasn't on the campus. It was, it was really about being in Boston. And, um, 
but I had a good experience, you know, very good. I studied sociology, Yay! which oddly enough, my father thought that was ridiculous, really did help me through my whole life. I still like groups like the Inman community. And, you know, I'm fascinated by how they think and what they do. And, you know, NIMBYs is something I, I, I didn't coin, but I think I may have been the first to put it in print when the mayor of Hayward, California talked about NIMBYs, people opposing affordable housing. And I was fascinated by how did this, you know, this homeowner group of self-interested parties team up inadvertently with environmentalists to stop growth, which would theoretically be a good thing. But if you look back 40 years, you can arguably say that our lack of supply of housing started back then when selfish homeowners teamed up with environmentalists to oppose development and uh, not in my backyard. So I was just always curious about these phenomena. And by the way, when I wrote those stories back in the 80s and 90s, kind of documenting the development boom in California, uh, you know, I get I get, you know, as you know, I get seared on on the Internet and criticized and called names. But back then it was really intense, except you'd get snail mail letters, even even some death threats, if you can imagine. And that was the intensity of that face off between growth and the environment, which to, to this day is really important. And interesting back then also race was important because a lot of this was racially motivated to oppose affordable housing. So here I am rambling. <laughs> Remember that no one wants to hear me on this uh, episode. They want to hear you. Oh, wow. So th this is obviously, we're talking about your San Francisco Chronicle days, right? Yeah, it was actually originally the Examiner, which is a Hearst paper. It in the Sunday Examiner Chronicle, as it was called then. Um, I wrote four columns a week. Uh, I wrote a public policy column, non-real estate for the LA Times. I wrote a syndicated column about this kind of growth issues in California in the 80s and 90s. Um, and then I wrote something called Living in the Bay Area, which was about neighborhoods that, you know, people, secret little areas that people didn't uh, to know about. And then I just wrote, I was a magazine writer. I did, I just wrote all the time. And, you know, I was a young man with a family and a new house. And so I, I had to scramble. Um, but that's what journalists do. You know, this is back in the day, Bill, where journalists hung out with cops in the local dive bars, they didn't go to the Hamptons and hang out with the rich and the elite like the media does today. Mm -hmm. I think it's one of the problems we have that the media has a, there's a big distance between the lifestyle of the, of the rich media and, you know, and the everyday person. I think that's why in the 2016 election, you know, kind of the working class people didn't have their, their, their finger on the pulse, not to get political because I'm not here. I'm just saying that. So I was used to the days when journalists didn't make any money. They made the same salaries as cops and teachers. And, you know, they were part of the mainstream and they covered the story kind of from the bottom up, not the top down. I mean, how much insight does a journalist get hanging out in the Hamptons with, whether it's the Clintons or the Trumps or, you know, the, the rich billionaires? It, it, there's no insight at all into how culture and society works. I, it seems like if I if wanted to fast forward to today, there are some people being very successful in the business of real estate, doing what you're talking about, documenting what's happening in their neighborhoods and really paying attention. It's what people care about. I mean, yeah. that feed on the street of the real estate industry is such a vital part of the dynamic nature of the real estate industry, the everyday realtor working a neighborhood, understanding a neighborhood. You know, no offense to, to Remax or Keller Williams or Realogy, but sitting in Austin and sitting in Denver and beautiful high rises and New Jersey, I mean, how much insight do these folks really get into the everyday uh, realtor? Um, and I, you know, I, I too can be guilty of that. Uh, the only difference is Inman News every day. I mean, we're interacting with, with millions of people in the industry that are giving us their opinion, as you know. They use our platform to give us a lot of opinion. <laughs> We're going to talk about that a little bit later. Inman News starting the website. Um, you know, you're talking mid '90s when things were just getting cranking there. Talk, can, you, can you talk about some of the struggles, maybe some of the early successes? You know, of starting up that online platform. Yeah, it's a reader at a time. Yeah. Um, you know, we started out digital. We didn't have print bill. It gave us a real advantage against competitors, even though we didn't even know their competitors. Keep in mind, I was a consumer writer. I was writing to a consumer audience. And the origin story, as I've told it a million times, but I'll just tell it really quickly, is that uh, I ran across a scandal at the National Association of Realtors. My editor said no one cares. Um, it was about NAR misspending $17 million on a tech adventure. 
and God love them for trying, but it failed. And so I, my editor said, no, it turned out that was the very year the commercial internet came about. And I, I did, used to do a radio, a weekly radio show. And um, the producer there said, hey, you should put some of your stuff in the internet. And we sat down, he showed me how to do it. And I posted, which is probably one of the early blogs about NAR scandal. And interestingly, I had a secret source inside NAR, an exec, well, I don't know, call him, whatever he was. And he knew what was going on and he gave me the scoop and I reported it every day and put it on the internet. And by the way, he's a secret source to this day and he's still quite influential in NAR. But he was the guy that, you know, God sent to the industry, I think. Um, we started reporting. And what happened is all of these early adopters of the internet, as you know, realtors, they're so opportunistic and so eager and pretty tech savvy, not all of them, but about 5%. Back then, interestingly, Bill, it was buyer's agents because they tend to be a little more, a little nerdy, but a little more savvy uh, on certain things like technology. Yeah. And then Remax agents who were tend to be the, the smarter agents at the time. And they read this and they were like, you know, yippee, someone's finally telling the truth about our trade group. And they were kind of what I'd call bleacher critics of NAR. They weren't part of the, you know, the volunteer, you know, elite sector. And they became our readers over that scandal. And we kept feeding them. And then what we learned is they were also interested in the latest, greatest technology. So we started giving it to them because you got to go back 25 years or whenever that was, 23 years. Not only was the industry uh, afraid of technology, they fought technology. And uh, so we were, you know, banning the flames of controversy, which is part of journalism's duty to stand up to authority. And the second thing we were doing is providing them with information they couldn't get elsewhere. Brad, we are just a couple of weeks away from, I don't know, roughly 4,000 industry professionals descending on Times Square, right? In Mid-Connect, New York. Um, let's talk about that. What, what's what's going to be happening this year? Uh, I know you're always like throwing a twist in there. Um, let, I'm going to give you this the floor here to kind of give us what's happening. Yeah, sure. Well, as usual, we have a couple hundred speakers, about uh, 80, 90 percent are inside the industry. Of those, 80, 90 percent are brand new faces. Um, our feeling is there's millions of people that uh, make their living in this business, and we should cast a wide net to find new and interesting voices and perspectives and we're big on diversity on the stage. We're big on smarts. Um, we always say follow the winners, not the whiners. So put really smart, savvy people on the stage. You know, we have a couple themes this year that are pretty serious. Um, you know, we had this major breakthrough news story by Newsday uh, about discrimination in the industry. And so we got all the whole team there from Newsday, which uh, is going to be interesting. Uh, we, we've got inspirational speakers. We've got some headliners. Uh, you know, it's just a great show. And then, of course, the networking is what people come to connect for, to meet new people, see old friends. Uh, it's just amazing, the Inman community, how connected they all are. Yeah, that 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 phrase has been bandied about so much, about all the connecting that goes on in the, the hallways or one of those places where it happens, right? But uh, for me, it's watching what happens, especially in the main room, Brad. And I, I want to look, you're a, you've started up companies, you're an entrepreneur. There, there's no way you're going to get BS'd by somebody on stage that, that wants to just kind of give those fluffy answers. You want the real information about what's happening with their company. Yeah. So do you have like an example of one of those interviews maybe on stage where, you know, you had to kind of get a little into it? Yeah, I mean, the one... The classic, probably, it's interesting, we've been doing Connect almost 25 years, but the one that, for me, and it, it really, it's, the stage isn't about our speakers, we always say it's about the woman from Omaha who came to Connect for the first time, and we really got to try to get our audience, or pardon me, our speakers to focus on that. A lot of conferences, you know, they do all of this stuff for the speakers, it's all about their egos, and they say and do what they want up there, but... They're only there for one reason, that's to serve the person that flew all the way to New York City in the middle of January. And But the one that stood out in all that was um, probably Gary Keller a year ago in San Francisco. For me, it was humbling, but it's also, I think, a really important debate. And he and I went toe-to-toe. -to -toe. He basically you know, put on a whiteboard the good guys and the bad guys, and he took a position that you know, the good guys had to take on the bad guys. I, of course, confronted him, but the unusual twist to this one was that 
Gary confronted me back. And it was quite a confrontation. And I think what it did in a lot of ways, for many, many years, um, I've been challenging the status quo and people with authority and asking them tough questions. And, and my belief was on behalf of my readers and the people in the audience. But I think over the years, I'd singed a few nerves, particularly the establishment. And some of them I know didn't like Gary Keller, but they love that Gary Keller took on Brad Inman. And uh, that's just part of Connect. You know, that's part of the tradition. Um, and we do try our best to get at the truth. And, or you know, the truth is too too grandiose. But we try to get the facts out. We try to not let people hide behind their corporate veneer. We try not to let them get away with, you know, BSing the audience. And as I say, my only role as an interviewer and other moderators is to represent the audience. I'm there representing the audience, you know, as a journalist in my case. Yeah, I was going to say, th- 35 year background as a journalist, you, 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 this, this real estate conference is completely different than any other conference I've been to. There's definitely, look, we have breakout sessions and, and those kinds of things are there that they're kind of mandatory, necessary. But boy, the what happens on Wednesday morning is completely different. It's really our attempt to, you know, it's on a, it's entertainment, it's education, and it's inspiration. But yeah, we try to create a dynamic on the main stage um, that is really exciting to the audience. And we spend a lot, a lot, a lot of time not only selecting the speakers, but choreographing the sequence from one to the next. You know, if we have a low note, we want to come back with a high note. We want people to feel good, but we also want to tell them the truth. Like, what's around the bend? What's What's scary and interesting and what's challenging? And, and the whole idea is, you know, the whole year is ahead of folks that come is to go back and be able to talk intelligently about all these things that we think are going to hit the news anyway. So get ready for them. And also for people to be a little more analytical and a little less in fear and less judgmental and maybe begin to embrace some of these new things because it may become part of their life. You know, you've had a lot of speakers over the years. I've been going since 2010 now. It's wow, it's I'm coming up on a decade, which is great. They're on the fringes, right? They're involved some way in the real estate world. It's really cool the way you weave these these nationally known speakers in. My my favorite is the the late David Carr from the New York Times. I mean, it was really just a wonderful presentation. I mean, he's a big part of that documentary that's out about the New York Times as well. Uh, been out for years. I wondered for you, out of the, for those people that are out there on the fringes, who are some of your favorites? Yeah, David Carr, you know, he was um, amazing. Planton, the photographer, was amazing. You know, I tend to go probably sometimes in a direction our audience doesn't completely love, but more of the deep thinking, thoughtful people who can talk about something that our audience wouldn't ordinarily get from the, you know, rah, rah, promo self-help speakers in real estate. When I entered the business, that's what I thought of the conferences, you know, and I get it, build them up, build them up, make them feel good about themselves. But I also think realtors are smart. They're intelligent, they're savvy, and they're aspirational. They want to be smarter. And so we fed, we fed to that aspiration. But, you know, it's interesting, probably one of my favorite speakers is just an interesting, fun story. And we have this thing called New Kids in the Block. And these are brand new entrepreneurs been in business for one year at the most. We give them an opportunity. The only people in the in the whole show who are entitled to talk about their company and, and their product. And the idea is let's bring them to, you know, the mainstream real estate industry. And so the industry can know about these new kids. And God love them. They're starting their company from scratch. You know, they came to the conference on their, as I always say, their personal credit card like an everyday realtor does. And no corporate, you know, expense account. And uh, they get up there and they're nervous as hell. They always have, you know, their hands are cold or they're sweaty. And uh, we coach them and encourage them. And I had a case where, you know, I I used to interview eight or 10 really quick in 15, 20 minutes. And I had a kid who got up there and he was his turn and he forgot his name and he forgot who he was. Or at least he was so nervous he couldn't spit it out. So I reached over, I put my arm around him, I said, hey, we'll do this together. And I introduced him and what his company did. And he was devastated. I thought he was going to have cardiac arrest or, you know, jump off the Bay Bridge afterwards. But in fact, what happened was there's this huge embrace by our community. Realtors know the expression. It's not how many times you, you fall down, it's how many times you get up. They've been down and out. They could relate to it. They could relate to failure. They could relate to mistakes. 
And they they gave him a big warm embrace everywhere he went in the the remainder of the of the event. People came up to him, introduced themselves, gave him a hug, supported him. He was probably the most successful new kid on the block that we've ever had, even though he didn't remember the name, his own name and his company. So I, you know, that this is a bottom up industry. And I think too long it was treated as bottoms down. The big shots at the top had the conference, the big shots were in the NAR, the big shots. And, you know, we're, we're less about that. And it's more about the everyday realtor, everyday entrepreneur. We try to put them on stage. We give them a good shot at you know, saying who they are. And, uh, and we blend them with, you know, with really famous people like Rupert Murdoch and, you know, Larry Page and on and on and on. You have, uh, you have an incredibly well-oiled machine at Inman, especially it's obviously visible through the, uh, the connect events, things that are happening and how that all plays together. And, and having been an ambassador, I get a little, I get a little kind of tiny peek behind the scenes on how, how well this thing is put together. Um, but I, I, I'm going to give you a lot of credit here. You've hired some amazing people over the years. And, and I want to know, what do you look for? What are you looking for when somebody, when you're trying to fill a spot or somebody's thinking, you know, wants to kind of get involved in, in your world? Uh, I like people that are smart and ambitious and uh, who work hard and are open-minded and maybe not too full of themselves. But, I, you know, I don't have any magic. I, I've just been really lucky and worked with some really amazing people. You know, in some cases, which I'm really proud of, we've created a, a stage for them, like, you know, Katie Lance and Chris Smith, Brian Boero and Mark Davidson. And they're just a long list of people at Inman. And then also I would just point to, you know, the squad we have at Inman right now is just amazing because we've kind of gone to the next level. We have this world-class uh, digital media group that came out of a company I was involved with, Curve, which we sold the Vox. And, they were at Box Media and, you know, some of the best and the brightest of digital media. And I think it's the next, you know, the next chapter in the Inman story where how do we begin to communicate to an industry and also a consumer, a consumer crossover story. The, the real estate story is just an unbelievable story. It's, you know, a tale of people's lives, um, individual stories. And so we're weaving those two together. And I think you're going to see some incredible journalism over the next several years as a function of those uh, amazing people. But, you know, other companies I've been with, uh, you know, we brought in uh, Morgan Brown, who worked with me on a company to Inman, and that, what a, you know, breath of fresh air he brought. And, and, and you know, and they've gone on and all these people and done really fantastic things. And I'm, I'm super proud of that. But, uh, you know, I'd give the Inman community credit for, you know, the Inman University, not Brad Inman. So I, I reached out to a couple of those people and asked, asked if they had a question for you. So are you ready? I, I'll just give you one of the questions from from someone that's worked with you before. Yeah, go for it. So Katie Lance, who you know and love, I asked her one question. Just what would she ask Brad? She said, ask him if he's going to retire. Yeah, um, <laughs> not. Um, well, I have another job. I'm CEO of Yaz. Many of you know Yaz, my wonderful wife. So that's a, that's a big job. So I'm never retired from that. No, I'm a writer. I'm a journalist. I'm an editor. Uh, I write every morning. You know, I publish some of what I write. I don't, God forbid, publish at all. Um, you know, I'm right now engaged in a book with uh, a, a writer that many people know at Inman, Andrea, and we're writing a book about the face-off, the Silicon Valley, the real estate uh, industry in Wall Street. It's really quite a great story that, you know, I think it's going to be a significant business book. And, you know, the, they're all competing for the, um, the pocketbook of the average consumer and the realtors in the mix in this whole thing. And it's, you know, it's about people going to prison. It's about corruption. It's about intrigue, the Department of Justice. It's, it's an incredible story. And so that, that's not retiring. That's just trying to document some of the things I learned over the years to share with the industry. Um, will I leave the stage? Uh, you know, I will only be up there as long as uh, I can make a contribution. And there's some really great moderators. Many, many people know Clea Peters, who's been moderating. She, you know, stepped in in a way that I really, really excited about, you know. And so retire, I, I don't know. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Sorry, Katie. <laughs> I got to be more explicit. If I ever do, you can come back and run in the news. You're, ma you're amazing. I love you to death. That's great. Social media and what it's done to real estate's 
obvious. They were early adopters. Realtors love new stuff and they were in there quickly and early and they figured out how to use it some well, some not so well. But I'd love your take as a journalist, how you feel social media has impacted journalism, which obviously it's got to be huge. Yeah, it gave everybody an opportunity to publish, you know, and instead of Hollywood controlling entertainment, you have Instagram and YouTube creating a channel for, you know, an individual creative artist from Ohio to surface without being in the network in the know and, you know, having the best agent. You had, in our word, in the blogosphere, you know, you have some incredible people who began blogging, you know, 10, 12 years ago who didn't have a voice on Inman News. They didn't have a voice anywhere and they suddenly became, you know, incredible bloggers. So it gave people a voice uh, to publish, uh, to create. And then social was this incredible vehicle to connect uh, people. So the real estate community got connected in a really profound way. It's interesting though, I always think social serve people up to come live to an event like Inman to connect in a, in a, in a direct face-to-face human way. And so they're, to me, they're all interrelated. They're all very positive. It's certainly given uh, a voice for a lot of people to comment and to shred what we say and do and you know come after me a lot, which is fine. And uh, so I think all of that's a good thing. And uh, you know, this idea of a corporate-owned centralized media, that was what people used to criticize about the media. And that was probably a fair criticism. And now we have a more democratic media. And guess what? It's messy. And who cares? I guess there's a protocol for what we should and shouldn't do online. But, you know, separate from acts of terrorism or crimes, I think anything goes. I've had people say, why don't you censor XYZ, who's always saying really awful things about you and the company? And I said, I would never in my wildest dreams censor that person. And the fact that sometimes someone makes me feel uncomfortable or challenges the facts just makes it easier for me to do my job. Now, does it create some personal discomfort at times? Sure, but that goes with the territory. So, um, you know, I'm still a, a traditionalist, an old, old form media guy. You know, you call a bunch of sources, you get a bunch of facts, you get all sides, you try to write as decently as you can and you publish. This is a more, can be a more impulsive media, but I think it's fine. I think it's all good. I think the world's better than it used to be. I, I'm just one of those people that thinks, you know, 99 out of 100 people are good. Only one out of 100 is bad. And I think we're constantly doing a really great job of improving our 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 situation in the world and life as human beings, including co- climate change. I think technology with human endurance and passion and brains, we're going to solve that problem. We're going to solve all these problems. It's just the nature of who we are as humans. And uh, I know that sounds Pollyannish to people, but I don't care. That's just how I, I view the world. Brad, you uh, you like to make predictions. You make them, you know, uh, online, uh, you know, as part of the Inman News platform. Can you give us a couple of your uh, early predictions for the, uh, for the, for the, call it for the early 2020s? Yeah. You know, Bill, my opening speech is going to be one of those predictions. And, um, you know, we have issues in this industry, affordable housing and housing supply and homelessness. Um, you know, and I've been on that stage many times, you know, pointing to all those difficult things like disruption. But that first morning at Connect, I'm going to take a whole different tack. And my my conclusion is um, the real estate market and the real estate industry has never been more dam- dynamic than it is right now. If you measure it by the market, the explosion of positive technology innovation and the people inside the real estate industry. This is a very dynamic time, you know, and uh, just start with the economy. You know, we've got 130 million people working in this country. Um, If you look at real estate and specific things, we've got, you know, 1% loan delinquency rate of over 90 days. Uh, You know, we have, a housing residential housing market valued at thirty three trillion dollars, but people, you know, only own owe about ten trillion. So they own sixty percent of their homes, which is at record highs. And then you look at technology; it's changing how we do real estate. Um, it's going to be easier to buy and sell a house this coming year. The market's going to be more efficient, so there'll be more transactions. It's easier to tech nest 
which is stay at your house because of health apps and FaceTime and robotic toilets and bathtubs. We're building more efficiently. We're living easier and safer due to keyless locks and other forms of security. And, you know, thanks to technology, we just talked about this, Bill. We've never had a time when real estate professionals have been better connected with each other and with the consumer. And so all of this adds up to, I think, a really spectacular year ahead. And who knows how long it will last, but it's a very dynamic time. And in any time there's something this dynamic, opportunity flows from it for those people that are, that are smart enough to take advantage of it, which is our audience at Connect. Brad, I've had you here way over time. I want to uh, ask you the same final question I've asked every guest on the uh, podcast, and that's if you could give one piece of advice to a new agent just starting in the business, what would it be? Outwork your competitors. Yep, that's yeah. that's my life story, and, and I maybe at you know you make sacrifices, and you know I don't life balance. I don't know. I guess that's a great thing. But if you love your work, you're passionate about what you do, then you know, it's not something, you know, that you want to be lazy about. You know, and I, the other thing to remind realtors, you guys don't sell credit swaps in Wall Street. You don't sell prescription drugs. You're not selling guns. You know, instead, you're making it possible for people to own a home, uh, the freest and safest place on the planet. Um, so pat yourself on the back. You know, give yourself some encouragement because you deserve it. Brad, I, I can't thank you enough for your time today. Look, I've wanted to talk to you on this podcast for four and a half years. And so to finally have you on has been a wonderful uh, experience for me. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you in a few weeks. Fantastic, Bill. Thank you. And congrats on your podcast. It's one of the ones that I actually listen to. <laughs>